I'm Marion Phillips. I'm a Master Gardener from the 2019 class. And um, before that, I had a life as an educator for many, many years and ended up retiring from UT as a professor there. Um, but when I, re when I, I always said when I retired, I was going to go to the Master Gardening class. It was like a retirement bucket list. So <laughs> I got there, and I have uh, been doing things with them not quite as faithfully as I should on my volunteering, but uh, it pays off at my house. So uh, anyway, so um, my, my love of hummingbirds started probably 12 to 15 years ago. And I put out a hummer in our, in our garden and um, could sit on the porch and watch them. So that first year, it was like I had a few, didn't have many. Um, I'm not sure what flowers I had at the time, probably not really geared to hummingbirds, but um, I had them at the feeder and sort of got hooked on them. But what sold me on the idea of always having my feeders, the next year I was digging in the dirt underneath the feeder, March or April, I have no idea when, and a hummingbird started buzzing me <laughs> right where I had the feeder last year, and the feeder was not there. So it was like, lady, <laughs> get inside, get your feeder out, I'm here. <laughs> well, why do they do that? You know, so, but that, it was like, oh my gosh, they're back, my little babies are back. So I was so excited. <laughs> so that started my journey of learning about hummingbirds and how to get them and keep them. And what I've done, what we're gonna be doing today is talking about the hummingbirds and some of the characteristics, their strengths that you can apply in attracting them to your yard. And at the very end, we're gonna talk about some flowers. You can find by Googling list of flowers, but I'm gonna to talk to you about why different flowers and why the birds want them, the strategies that you can use in getting them to your yard. And uh, one of the things, I'm going to give you a few just facts. You probably already know this, but when you start looking and thinking and reading and listening to podcasts about hummingbirds, they are fascinating. They're ordery, they're cantankerous, they're contentious, they're lovable, they're beautiful, they're agile, they're just amazing, and they're tiny. They're tiny, they're so tiny. From the bill to the tail, three to five inches. They weigh, I've got 3.34, that's too specific. They're around three grams, and it takes 10 of them to make one ounce. Mm. Size of a penny, about the size of a penny. Their heart, they have proportionally the largest heart per, proportionally per size. It's, for us as a human, their heart is about six times larger than our heart, proportionally. Um, their flight, 200 to 600 beats, uh, their heart is beating 200 to 600 beats per second. Yeah, <laughs> what did I say, second? Yeah, 200 to 600 beats per second. Now that's 200 to 600 beats per second. Think about it. Our heart is, what are we looking at? 70 beats per minute, you know, approximately, something like that. This is per second, and it can go up to 1,200 beats per second. I mean, it's amazing what their little hearts do. That's why the heart is so, so large proportionally. It's because of all the amazing abilities that they have, and the heart is supporting that. Their uh, metabolism, their metabolism, when they take in sugar, 100%, almost 100%, 99 point blah, 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 percent of the sugar that they take in, or the nectar, is converted to energy. So their metabolism rate is the highest in the, in the animal kingdom and certainly within our kingdom. If we ate proportionally the number of calories that they eat proportionally, 
We'd be eating seven, eight, nine hundred calories. No, I'm not. Seven hundred and fifty thousand calories per day, portionally. I mean, that's those are broad figures, but um, to get the impact of what their little bodies are doing, they are working hard. And that metabolism takes in that sugar and produces the energy that they have to get them with their heartbeat racing like this, their wings going up to 80 cycles per, per minute. Um, they are incredible. But with that happening all day long, that metabolism just racing like that, they're looking for food all day long. They've got to have food. And it's in the form of the nectar from the flowers, and it's in the form of protein. We're going to talk more about protein in a few minutes. The torpor state, do you know what the torpor state is? That is when they go to sleep at night, basically. But it's when they, it, the sun starts going down, and you know they'll, if you watch your feet are close to sunset, you'll see them darting in to get their last sips before they go to bed. And they go find their perching place and their body literally just slows, shuts down almost. Their heartbeat goes down to like 50 heartbeats um, per second. It just, everything slows way down so that the energy and the food that they have taken in during the day will last them through, through the night. And the only way they can do that is by shutting down it going into a state of torpor it's called it's hibernation and what they do is they find a perching place and their little feet attach or you know their feet are not for walking you know the boots are for walking <laughs> their feet are not for walking you will never see them walking you might see them move a little on a branch but you won't see them technically walking like other birds do those feet attach, close down over the branch, that whatever they're perching on, and even though their body is relaxing and going into torpor, those feet never let go. All night long, they, they remain, that is what stabilizes them and keeps them from falling down into predators, falling off the land, you know, whatever. It, they attach to that perching place. And we're gonna talk about, uh, perching places. You might have seen some of the photos where they there was a vine, they were perched on, they have an old fence they had perched on. Having a place for them to perch is very important. We'll talk a little more about that. So you've got this amazingly high metabolism that drops off at night, every night, every time it gets dark and cold. Like um, this morning, I didn't see any hummingbirds, and I'm not seeing many right now anyway. They come through, they're migrating through. But um, in the summertime or later in the spring when I know I've got my little neighborhood, my, my little peeps that have come back year after year, um, they don't show up right away because it's very cool on these cool mornings. It takes their body a while to acclimate and, and come out of the torpor and, and become active again. And once the, it warms up and their bodies warm up, then they take off again. They're, and there's, they're discovering new species, but right now they're estimating approximately, sorry, approximately uh, 350 species in the Americas. They are not anywhere else in the world. If you live Italy, Europe, Australia, there are not hummingbirds. They're only in the Americas, which I think is so fascinating. And the U.S. only has approximately 20 species that have been identified. And today, we're basically talking about the ruby-throated. That's the one I know. That's the one most of you will know and see. That's basically the only one on the eastern seaboard, from Florida all the way up to Canada. West is where they have several other species and the migration has, they're coming up through the land mass in Mexico. So they're coming on up and they have had a migration of more variety on the West Coast. But the ones on the East Coast, the ruby-throated uh, hummingbird, has to come across the Mex uh, Gulf Coast, which is a 600-mile flight for them 
that they can do in one, they have to be able to do it in one flight from Mexico to up and down the East Coast, basically. And that's what you're gonna see. They're stopping in along the way to fuel up as they keep on going north on the migration. And then we have those that decide they like our yards. <laughs> but I think that's fascinating and uh, that they're only in the Americas. I mean, and, and I have, one of the podcasts I was listening to said, we're sorry folks if you live you know, in Europe, you're just going to have to come this way if you want to see the hummingbirds. We actually went to Ecuador, and um, this place we were staying, um, I don't want to say cultivated hummingbirds, but they catered to hummingbirds. And so every morning they went out and filled all the feeders, and, and there were, I don't know how many different varieties, probably about... 15 or 20 different varieties just in this one area in Ecuador, which Ecuador is a big area for finding diversity. Colombia is also another one. Dragsters of the bird world. Okay, their wings are going up to 80 times per second. That's why sometimes you don't even see them unless you, your camera will slow it down. You can take a photograph sometimes. But when you're watching them, that, those little, they just disappear because they're going so rapidly. And they have very large muscles across their chest to accommodate that particular skill that they have, that trait. They can go up to 35 miles per hour and they can dive 50 miles per hour, you know, going down. And they equated that to like pulling G's in a dive bomber, you know, that, you know, they, and that, Many people could not survive it at the same rate of speed. Um, the maneuverability, they go up, down, side to side, backwards, forwards, hovering, and they can even not only go backwards, but they can fly upside down for short periods of time. Not, you, it's not often that you see that, but occasionally you will see one that will flip over and go uh, upside down Okay, we were talking about, uh, and this maneuverability, once again, <clears throat> one of the reasons that that is so um, important is that that maneuverability allows them to avoid danger. Other, other birds, other, um, they don't really have predators because of the unique abilities they have. Predators would involve Cats, house cats, feral cats, and I'm not going to say much more about that. I don't want to offend anybody, but everything you read and talk about says cats are a big offender of hummingbirds. Uh, the other thing, praying mantis can mm -hmm. take down a hummingbird, um, and some spiders maybe, if it's a particularly large spider, might be able to. These are not, I don't think, that common in our area, but I could see in parts of the country, maybe out west, maybe it's a little more common. I'm not sure. I've never seen any of that happening, and I don't have praying mantis that I've seen, which probably means I just haven't looked for them, right? <laughs> so, um, but they, um, that maneuverability allows them to get away from most things that we would consider that other birds would be in danger of being maybe snagged by. Um, I will tell you a quick story. Um, I have the garage opener has that cord, that safety cord that comes down with the red thing on the bottom. It pulls in hummingbirds. And so we put blue tape on it, which helps. They don't doesn't attract their little attention. Um, but one got in there last summer. I had the doors open and it got in. And so I thought, you know, I tried everything to shoo it out. And finally, um, I had to climb, <laughs> climb up on my husband's truck on the top. And it was, it had been flying all around. It was nesting on, or sitting, perching on the 
um, rails of the garage mm -hmm. tracks, mm -hmm. opener tracks. And I was able to get up there and literally, it was tired by then because it had been flying and it hadn't had sugar. And I was able to take it in my hand, very fragile, you know, very carefully. And it, when you do that, they stop. They just sort of freeze. And so I was able to get it outside. And I'd already put some sugar water outside hoping to lure him out on the top of the ladder. So I let it, and it went straight to that sugar water and then it was gone. Mm -hmm. um, but it, they, that is something that I first experienced that holding one at Imes. Have you ever been to Imes when they have the banding of the bird, hummingbirds? They have it in the summer. I can't remember when. You'll have to look on their website and see when it might be coming up, but it is the most fascinating thing, usually in the heat of the summertime. And they capture them um, safely, and then this, this banding team will come out and, and ban the birds. And through that bird banding that happens all over the U.S., uh, they have discovered that the hummingbirds can live normally average three to five years but they have found that have left, lived up to 12 years, so 10 and 12 years, and they've been able to identify that through the banding when they were caught again for banding. So, um, maneuverability. Okay, I, I get distracted easily by these. There's so much interesting information about it. Metabolism, highest of all, and we talked about that. Approximately 100% of the sugar or nectar is turned into energy. Um, now, we're going to talk about three particular characteristics, strengths, that are going to be your friend in attracting hummingbirds on a regular basis. One is their memory. They have an incredible memory and also program genetically about migration, where they're going, how to navigate. Have you ever thought how a, a new hummingbird that is hatched this summer, his mother has released him, he's on his own, um, he's been taking care of himself all summer, but how does he get back to Mexico and then come back the next year? They are genetically programmed instinctively to know when it's time to migrate and how to get there, how to get down, how to fly, how to prepare and fly over the Gulf to get to Mexico for the winter and then to come back. Now, that memory, during the migration, when they start coming back, they remember their food sources from the prior year. And so, the hummingbird feeders, the ones that I have coming right now to my feeder, I'm almost positive, I, there's no way I can prove it, but based on the information, they have been to my yard before. They're coming back because they remember that I have feeders and I have another secret. I have an island out front that I start putting red flowers in early. <coughs> and I, I buy, the, the cardinal one is one of them, that they're an annual, they're fairly inexpensive. I put them out knowing that by the heat of the summer, they usually, for me, don't do very well. Other people's are beautiful, mine never are. But that's okay, because the red, that they will come and find not only my bird feeders, but they're gonna find some flowers that are blooming. I also have spring flowers, Colum uh, columbine, um, no, that's the name. Oh, the red buckeye. I have the red buckeye. It's not this big, but it had one plume on it. And, and I've heard that when they get big, they're gorgeous with all the red blooms. So I'm waiting, and I'm going to live that long, to see it filled with red blooms in early spring, pulling in tons of hummingbirds. But I had a bloom on it this year, and I know, I know it helped bring hummingbirds to my yard. Um, Fuchsia, if you happen to have fuchsia, it usually, you'll find them in baskets as opposed to uh, living in the ground around here. Um, ephemerals, like um, trillium, 
Some of the other, uh, I'm drawing a total blank right now. It'll come back to me in a few minutes because I have a list. But the spring flowers that come out and have bright color on them, the ephemerals, are going to be a friend to bringing them and having not only your feeder there, but having something in the yard for them also that they can, or it could be a, a basket, a hanging basket. If you've got a small patio or a small area, put up a big old hanging basket that has flowers in it that are, we'll talk about what kind of flowers, tubular, bright colors, that kind of thing, uh, so that you can attract them in as you're migrating through. You might, we might not keep a lot of these that are coming through, they may just keep on going. Some of them may decide to live in our yard. I, I can't tell which is which. But it sure is fun to speculate <laughs> that they like the yard. All right, the next really strong point to remember is the visual acuity. They have an extremely sharp distance vision and very um, strong sense of their visual acuity. And this pays off to them not only when they're flying, which I didn't, this was something new I learned as I was preparing this. You have two birds, and there's a, no, there's not a third one, but there's two there. And they're right here. They got the feeder right there. The deck is right there. What keeps them from going into each other? Well, the visual acuity, that is so strong in them that they are very aware of all of their surroundings and it keeps them from running into things at a speed of 35 miles an hour. So it keeps them uh, so that they can do that maneuver. And the maneuvering, along with the visual, it all goes together. It's such a package deal in this little bird. But they are able to maneuver in such ways. And the visual acuity that they have is an aid in helping them avoid obstacles, avoid each other when they're doing it. Have you ever seen them peck at each other? I, I've actually seen them strike each other. Pardon? They're territorial. Oh, man. Yes, ma'am. They are very territorial. And they fight. Yes, yes. Um, the visual part also comes into the, uh, on the ultraviolet spectrum, they see colors that we can only imagine because they have a broad range and the vibrant colors, reds, we always know red, but purples, pinks, bright blues. Uh, there are a lot of colors that are very bright, very vibrant, that, are, um, that attract the hummingbird. So my secret for this is in the island that I have out front, because I imagine the hummers are flying over. Okay, they're flying over our area. I have a hummingbird feeder. It's got the red base on it got fresh water in it, it pulls them in, but as they're up there, they're also going to see my red flowers, and I have some purples too. So they're going to see that, and that's going to pull them in, because they're high, they're flying, and that visual acuity helps them identify food sources as they're passing through. It is it just the whole package, the whole package. So once again, you know that they've got that strong, vision, utilize it to pull them into your yard. Then the other one is taste. They have more receptors for sweet. And this was, um, they don't smell for, for, they have, there is a study out there now that says they maybe can smell certain things. Danger, I, I don't know, it was kind of a esoteric kind of research, and I wasn't going down that rabbit hole this time. <laughs> uh, it talked about that um, basically hummingbirds do not have a sense of smell. So they're relying on the taste. And over the years, their savory glands have actually evolved so that they taste sweet also. So they have the, the sweet receptors and the savory receptors all working together to help them identify the sweetest source of energy for them, their food sources. They are looking for sugar uh, flowers with high sugar content. That top red one right there is the cardinal that I put out. Mine never looked that pretty though, I'll tell you that. 
That's a sage over there. I have an, uh, an autumn sage out right now that's already beginning to bloom. And this is a salvia, a purple salvia. There, it's a little early for most of them. But you want flowers that you see the bright colors. You want flowers that taste good and that provide them with lots of energy and sugar. Metabolism is working hard. So those were the three. Memory, visual acuity, and taste. Those three strategies right there. If you keep those in mind and think about applying them to what you do in your yard, you're, you're providing the environment that they love. They're going to want to be there. Now, we're going to talk about feeders for a minute. We've already said a little bit about them, but um, the ratio is four to one. And I make a, a quart, maybe two quarts of it at a time, um, measure it out, and you need to make sure it's four to one because that gives about a 20% sugar content. And the least that they will look for in a flower is 12%. I have not found it easy to identify flowers and the sugar content of the flowers. If anybody finds that, <laughs> send me a reference on that because you've got some. No, I wanted to ask you something. Um, I make my own bread. And I use some, uh, you know, raw sugar. Can you use no. that? Just regular cake? No. Oh. no. Okay, just want to find out. I don't want to mess with the right. thing. Right. <laughs> and that is something, I'm going to throw out something here, and I feel very strongly about this, so I am going to go ahead and talk to it. There is a guy named John Shuey that has written a book on hummingbirds. And his phrase that will always be with me is ethical responsibility. And he uses that phrase in relationship to the feeders. And he basically says, and I'm going to paraphrase here, if you don't keep them clean, don't put them up because you're hurting the birds. He said, if you're going to put it up, then you'd be responsible for keeping that hummingbird feeder clean, the food in it clean, so that you do not create a health hazard. That is one of the... the um, they're finding when they rescue hummingbirds, they are finding that poor feeding has attributed to the sickness of, of hummingbirds. You know, we talk about not many predators. We, we can do it in our backyard by keeping, by letting our water become moldy, cloudy, fermenting. Mm -hmm. I remember reading that it swells their tongues, they can't get it through their beak. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And that's why they, uh, they're, they're starving themselves. Yeah. Interesting. Yes, that would totally, because, so, I'm going to say it again. If you're going to use a, birding, a, hum, a hummingbird feeder, please be responsible, keep that water clean. I don't put that much water in my feeders now. Mm -hmm. I put much less, <clears throat> probably about half of that mm -hmm. <clears throat> during the peak seasons. Right now, I'm putting even less than that because it, the frequency is not there, so I can change the water out. Um, and, you know, the hummingbirds are not crowding the feeders right now, so I want to change that water out. I might go a day or two, and who knows, I might not have a hummingbird, but I can change the water out to keep it fresh for them. I make it up, put it in the refrigerator. You boil the water, put your sugar in, let it cool down, but I make a big batch at once so that you're not continually having to go in and mix up the sugar and the water. Uh, if you watch and you'll get a feel for where you've placed your feeder <clears throat> and how much, how often you need to change it. Mine needed every, in the summertime, every two to three days because it begins to get cloudy. I have one of them that's, uh, two of them that are getting a good bit of sun. <clears throat> um, so it gets cloudy a little faster, begins to ferment, so I just have to make sure and um, to keep them clean because I don't want to create a problem for the hummingbirds in all this time of working to get them there. I don't want to kill them off or, or make them ill. So please be very uh, conscientious of that. Also, yes? So the temperature of the the food for them is in the winter, because in the summer, mine is in the sun. Sun. They'll take it. Flowers are in the sun. Okay. They take it. They won't take 
I would be cautious about boiling water that you get it cooled down before you put it out for the feeder. But uh, it heats up in the summertime, and no, it doesn't seem to impact them. The heat of the sun warming them up. Um, one other thing I wanted to say about them, I have put one in the back, and last year, two years ago, I put another one in the front. The house keeps them separated. That seems to have worked nicely. The one on the back porch, or hanging off the eave, I also put one, attached it to the window, a little, um, a little um, su suction. It's a very small one. I think it has a couple of holes in it. To, for the, and I can watch it sitting on the couch and watch it. And it's, it's away from the one hanging under the eave, and it's kind of hidden on the porch. And actually, they, I, I would have them at that one stuck to the window, suctioned to the window, and at the feeder at the same time. They didn't seem to fight over that. Um, for whatever reason. I had two, one under the eave and one out in the yard, fought like crazy, you know, that diving and, and, and defending their property, their territory. But from the front to the back, it seems to be better. Um, I have found two, because I love the hummingbirds and I talk to my neighbors about them, that my neighbors are putting out hummingbird feeders. And there's a little piece of me that's jealous, <laughs> just to be perfectly honest. But I got to thinking about it, and I, 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 so I'm being nicer. About it. <laughs> I'm, but I am being the, the, the feeder troll. You need to go out and change that water. Yeah, that's I see some light moles out there. But, um, but actually, I've decided it's a good thing because we're creating a community of feeding sources for the birds. Mm -hmm. And birds will, I've noticed that they seem to go in a circular pattern almost from front to back sometimes. <coughs> and they consider all of that their territory. So they kind of circle through and I've got flowers off on the sides and the, and the different places for them. So, but there's another strategy they use called trap lining. Fishermen used to do this. They put out their traps and go check them. And Well, the hummingbirds know that there are multiple sources, and this is where the neighborhood comes in, that they are going to several houses and making a circuit around the neighborhood. But once again, that's keeping them in our little part of the country, our little neighborhood here. So I'm OK with that. So um, it's very interesting, their feeding patterns. Um, they, they do like to circulate, but when they find a good source, they're going to protect it. Uh, I was reading on Facebook and wanted to make sure that um, it said, like, for cleaning them, you know, you can't use, like, soap and water. But can you, it says with lemon juice or lemon juice and vinegar. Is that true or not? No bleach. And I have had two sources to say that a vinegar solution, just don't make it very strong. You can use the vinegar, and I would leave out the lemon, but rinse it several times after you get the vinegar out, rinse it very carefully. And if you'll find that if you're changing your water out every two to four days, you're not going to have to clean as much either. You may be able to just rinse them out easily with a small brush or something, kind of rinse around in there and get them out. So that should work. I just want to make sure you, yeah. know, you see this. I want to find out. You know, yes. Because who knows what's being put on there. Exactly. And I have two good sources that did say a vinegar solution, a mild vinegar solution, is helpful if you need it. Mild. Make it mild. Okay. Um, those feeders are just awesome. All right. Now, this, this is one of my favorite pictures. I did not know I was taking it until I put the card in the computer to start looking at the pictures. And I can see a little white probably an aphid coming off my plants because I seem to have a crop of aphids. 
uh, or a little white fly, some sort of little white insect is right there. And he's just about to take it in. And I think that is the most fascinating <laughs> picture that I've ever taken. Um, but that gets into protein versus nectar. Do they just use sugar water? No. Actually, protein is about 70% of their diet, which is pretty amazing to think about that because we've talked about them needing the sugar, metabolizing it for that rapid energy, but they also need uh, the protein, which they get from small, the little bugs that are on your plants, little um, spider eggs that they might get off the leaves of plants. Uh, they can scoop through the air, but oftentimes they're sitting. They do both, both sitting and taking in. That was probably opportunistic for this particular <laughs> bird. They uh, oftentimes like to fly through the air and take the bird, uh, take the bugs in. Uh, they can't pick them off. So. This is another example of a perch for them, and it's a hyacinth bean vine, which is one of my favorite um, vines for the hummingbirds. Um, he's perched on that. And they, it gets so thick that they'll perch and kind of hide down in it and watch the, the uh, feeder and then shoot out and run uh, another hummingbird off. But <clears throat> protein and nectar. So. The point here is, don't keep your yard so pristine. Be very careful about your insecticides that you use. And as a master gardener, I would like to say it would be great if you never used them. Um, I also know there are times that they do get used. I'll put it like that, very gently. And uh, so, they are susceptible. Water, you need a water source for them. Once again, if you're using a bird bath and you don't keep it clean, uh-uh, not good for them. But if you do happen to have a bird bath and you can put one of those little sprinklers that comes up from it, oh, they love it. They'll go play in it and love it. This, actually, I was watering it um, in the yard and this butterfly, this uh, hummingbird, is flying in the water, coming from the sprinkler, and playing around in the leaves here. And on the PowerPoint earlier, there was one that was literally laying on his back and wallowing in the water. <laughs> it's just like, oh, let me get all that water, let me cream my, my uh, wings and all my feathers. So uh, they love your water sources when you start watering. I also played around with a little mister in a tree so they'd have a perch and the water. But I don't think I was very successful with that last year. But think about it. I had a friend who welded together some little copper piping, and then we put one of those little heads that made a mist out on it, and it would mist into the tree. I didn't see a lot, but that could have just been me. But if you have someone handy around your house that might be able to make something like that, that would be a good idea. There he is. He's just taking it, taking it all in. Okay, perching places. This year, that particular year, I put a wire between two columns, and they loved it. It was close to the feeder. They would perch on it, and then, you know, get some, perch, get some, perch. They have to go, they have to, they have to feed at least every 12 to 15 minutes. So they're continually looking for food. And when they're not, they're resting, which is conserving their energy or looking for protein. Um, so having places for them to rest is very important. I've seen those little hummingbird uh, swings like, put up a wire, put a plant that has a vine on it, give them something like that. I mean, you don't have to get fancy. They'll find a place to perch. <clears throat> All right, now, we've talked about the strategies. Now let's talk about some of the flowers. And I want you to think in terms of three seasons. Planting for the spring, when they're migrating through. Planting for the summer, which you, is the time when the mamas 
are building their nest, raising their babies. And by the way, I've never found a nest. I've looked and looked and looked. I've never been able to find a nest. They're very small, look like a little teacup, a little tiny teacup. And their eggs are the size of little peas or beans, mm -hmm. just very small little bird, little eggs in there. I've never found one where, where we live. Um, but you're looking for flowers that have bright colors, yellows, reds, blues, whites, fuchsia. They're tubular because the beak goes down into the flower to get it. And um, they have a lot, they have a high content of nectar. And this is where I want to encourage as many natives as you can put in your garden. If you are able to, to do natives in your yard, that's awesome. Um, some of the cultivars, some of the plants that you're going to get at some of the nurseries have been so um, inbred, I'm, I don't know the word I need right there, but that they've just taken away a lot of the smell, a lot of the nectar, and they're really just very pretty, but maybe not as useful for the hummingbird. So, and the downward facing flowers are their really favorite because they come up underneath and the ability to hover lets them hover as they move in and out of that flower. Okay, three seasons. Fuchsia, columbine, that is a butterfly bush and should not be on that slide because that is not blooming in the springtime as a rule, or at least at my house. But, um, on your handout, on the back, if you will look, there are several flowers listed and they're just samples. I just put a few under the different seasons for you to look at and see about. Uh, Hookara is a great one that's foam flower. Um, I'm still drawing blanks here. Somebody read to me what I got on my springs there. <laughs> <clears throat> what have I got? For spring, for summer, or fall? Spring. spring. For oh, spring. For spring, yeah. For what have I got there? Oh, the bucket. Wisteria and Carolina Jasmine. Oh, mm -hmm. honestly, those are awesome for it. So, there are uh, lists out there. Just Google it. You will find a ton of sources for flowers that cater to hummingbirds. Summertime, oh, there's tons of them in the summertime. This is the hyacinth bean, one of my favorites. I grow them from my seed each year. Uh, there's a little hummingbird, I mean, not a hummingbird, but a butterfly right there. This is at the UT Gardens, the big arch that has uh, hyacinth bean on it all summer long. Uh, Hookera, uh, Croscosmia. Croscosmia, or is it Croscosmia? The hummingbird up there, I put those in the yard. They come back every year and they have a, a long tube, tubular shaped flower. Easy to grow, the hummingbirds love it. And they sit out on those stems out there. And I've got some pictures where they're literally just, all you see is the little tail end of the hummingbird because their, their he whole head is down in the flower getting the nectar. Fall. You cannot go wrong with sage, sages and salvias, perennials and annuals. They love them. And they go to frost, which is another awesome uh, thing. This is the black and blue, blue salvia, which they would go with, uh, to each one of these. And this is a sage right here, pineapple sage, I believe. And another one here, pineapple or autumn sage. So the fall flowers are, are a lot of fall flowers. You want something that will go all the way to frost if possible, because that way you're going to catch the migrating fly, uh, hummingbirds that are going south to fly across. Go. Now, um, there. I remember reading a, quite a while ago about make sure you take your hummingbird feeders in. Well, you don't have to worry about that. Remember that memory and their inherent ability to know where to migrate, when to migrate, the pathways. They know when it's time. 
There, the research is not real clear on why, maybe due to the length of the day, the amount of sun, the temperature, but they know when it's time to hit the road and mosey on back down to uh, Mexico. And um, there are cases over on the western coast where some of the anise hummingbird um, will come down from Alaska and maybe stop off in Seattle, somewhere along the western coast there, and stay for the winter. But um, ours basically just go on back south. All right, can't go wrong with the salvias and sages. And that, folks, I'm going to leave you with, there are several sources. On the handout, you have the source of two of the books that I really like, June Osborne and um, Robert Sargent. Robert Sargent is from Alabama, and he's one that is, is really involved in the banding of hummingbirds, and he's written a very nice book also. John Shuey has a book that's great. The humming, you can go online for Hummingbird Society, Fine Gardening, the Hummerbird Study Group, hummingbirds.net. I also put on the handout some of the podcasts that I found, very entertaining, very uh, fact-filled, and just great to listen to. Um, you will probably find many more than I have found as you start looking. Now, with all of that said, I hope that you are ready to go and find some amazing strategies, use some of these strategies to, to lure in some of the hummingbirds to your yard this summer and have a good time. Make sure, make sure you have a favorite place to sit, a comfy chair, inside or out, where you can see that feeder. And when I'm sitting outside on the deck reading, they come right to me. And with this yellow one, they will come right up. I've had them come right to my face and, you know, are you something good to eat? And then <laughs> zoom off, and, you know. But, but you, what you wear, my husband will wear a red t-shirt out in the yard and they just will flock, not flock to him, but they'll, they'll hit him, you know, run by him to see if he's something good to eat. Uh, so they're very, very friendly uh, because they basically don't have predators. They can move faster than any of us. So I hope you have a good time setting up your feeders and your yards and getting to go, getting your bur uh, yard ready for them this summer. And is there anything that I can uh, answer any questions? And by the way, the uh, females, the, the males, you know, try to attract the females with all their pretty feathers and their dancing. And if they catch one, uh, the, then the bird, they do their mating thing and the females go one way and the male goes another way. And she weighs, uh, builds the nest, raises the young, boots them out, continues to eat, and then they all migrate back. Is that question? Yes. Is it okay to wash the bird feeders with dawn and water? I think the dawn will leave a residue. You're better off water and scrubbing. Just scrub it out. You know, if you're going to um, maybe use a little vinegar early in the, like right now, and get it good and clean, and then just make sure you've got it rinsed very, very well. And um, But I wouldn't use the dawn. I saw the documentary, I even have a book about it, um, that the bird's nest is about the size of a golf ball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, people are. And they, they make them, if you look at pictures of them, they look like an extension of the bark on the tree. Mm -hmm. So that makes them very difficult to identify. Mm -hmm. My husband, a couple of summers ago, said, you know, you, you really need to be careful because we have blue jays out there. And so I've tried to um, do a little <coughs> reading about are blue jays a predator? And the only thing I could find is that they might, if they discover the nest, eat the eggs in the nest. But once again, they're faster. The hummingbirds are faster than the blue jays, and their maneuverability makes it so that that part is not the dangerous part. It could be that the blue jays can get the eggs. 
but other birds could get the eggs also. I have blue jays and a bunch of other kind of birds and critters. And when I did, uh, when we did have the um, hummingbirds around, <clears throat> it didn't bother really the hummingbirds. They they have so many unique abilities that separate them from other birds in the bird kingdom, and that protect them from it, and for the most part. So yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's just amazing to watch. I get so excited about them. <laughs>